Welcome to the UMTRC webinar series. Today we are going to hear from Charles James, and today is the second webinar in a series of webinars specifically for FQHCs. Yesterday we talked about assessing payer mixes and some reimbursement and challenges. Today we're going to focus on behavioral health and substance abuse. And then we're going to take a break for the holidays and then come back on January 12th. We're going to finish out this three-part series with evaluation and management billing for FQHCs. We are recording today's webinar and the recording will be made available on our YouTube page. And Charles has agreed to send us the slides, which we'll also put on our archived webinars page of our website. We are going to hold all questions until the end, but then allow some time for Q&A. And as always, thank you for joining us. And Charles, I'm going to go ahead and hand everything over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. So thank you to the Indiana Rural Health Association and to the Upper Midwest Telehealth Resource Center for putting on this series and inviting me to join you. Uh, as Becky mentioned, today's topic is behavioral health, billing, substance abuse treatment for FQHCs. We're gonna talk about some of our basic definitions, really lay the groundwork for what we're going to talk about, and we'll progress through standard FQHC billing for behavioral health providers. And most importantly, or equally importantly, I don't know how we wanna weigh it, care management services for FQHCs, which include behavioral health integration and psychiatric coordination of care, psychiatric coordination of care, pardon me. I hope I can speak uh, better through the rest of this. So I think these last two, this BHI and psychiatric coordination of care as part of care management services are something that get dramatically overlooked. And I would personally like to see implemented much more consistently and broadly through our FQHCs and our rural health clinics. These are uh, services that apply to us both. And I think these last two, I, I don't know of anyone using them. I've never heard of anyone using them. So hopefully we can change that for today. So uh, just out of curiosity, I went and referred back to the Social Security Act and the statutes that created the FQHC program, they're a little different than the RHC program. Some of the statutes, we share a common, uh, we, we share common statutes. We don't share common statutory definitions. So that means our RHCs and our FQHCs, we actually have a different source of the law that defines us and they define us a little differently than one another. And one of the ways that they define us differently is these required primary health services that FQHCs have that are defined much more strictly for FQHCs than they are for RHCs. So that may not be important to people, but it was a curious little nugget to me. Now, as we see here, we've got the public health and wealth, the public health and welfare chapter 6A, subchapter 2, subpart 1, say that quickly, which in the Social Security Act defines health centers. Now, I abridged most of the required list of services because I wanted to get down to where it says, you know, for FQHCs, you have to be able to refer to behavioral health providers. You have to have an agreement with, of course, OBGYN and pediatrics as part of your definition of being an FQHC. So any of those you can have in-house, but if you don't have those in-house, you have to be able to refer out. And of course, one of those are behavioral health, including substance abuse disorders and mental health services. Now, we have this issue in the rural health clinic world that um, 
right in the same list of definitions. So the on the one hand, the Social Security Act defines what FQHCs have to do and have to provide, and that's where these required primary health services come from. And in another section, they define kind of who we are. And there's an explicit entry for federally qualified health centers. There's an explicit entry for rural health clinics. And there's this paragraph between the two. And it's, it's kind of difficult to read when you drill down into the language. And it's really under rural health, but in talking with a lot of regulators, et cetera, I've, for example, I've gone in and asked the question, can an FQHC be solely for behavioral health? The answer has been no. Now, part of what we hang our hat on is this section 1861, which is a hard stop for rural health clinics that we get, we cannot be primarily a rehab agency or for the treatment of mental diseases. Now, the only reason I bring this up, because on the rural health clinic side, it's a hard stop that we cannot exceed 51% of our provider hours as behavioral health. It doesn't appear that we have that same hard stop in the statutory definition of our FQHCs. It's part of the point I'm trying to make. So the circle I'm talking in here is that we have to be careful as FQHCs, I think, to make sure that we're not just a behavioral health uh, facility, but that we're also, our mission is very clear in all of the language that we see in the statutory guidance, that we're really, we're here to be a primary care operation and provide primary health services. We have a list of required health services, which include physician services, service supplies incident two, there's practitioner supplies, service supplies in there too, et cetera. And down in the list of required primary health services are these referral to behavioral health. And, and again, you have to have that contract with a behavioral health provider. We, so, so I'm just, I'm trying to establish some of the statutory foundation for how much behavioral health we can provide in an FQHC relative to primary care and what I'm arguing is it's not as clearly defined for us as FQHCs as it is for RHCs, but we still need to be careful with that ratio. We see that as part of our encounter definition for RHCs and FQHCs is that a medically necessary medical or mental health visit is defined as an encounter. Of course, we have qualified preventive health visits. We're not here to talk about those today but the visit must be a face-to-face, one-on-one encounter between the patient and our fill-in-the-blank qualified provider, which includes at the end here, our clinical psychologist and our clinical social worker, during which one or more RHC or FQHC services are rendered. So we're back to that physician services, service supplies, and tenant two. So uh, we have a straightforward definition that behavioral health is built into our FQHC encounter and our clinical psychologists and our clinical social workers are approved providers. So have at it, right? So our Medicare qualified FQHC providers include our clinical psychologists, our clinical social workers. Now here's one difficulty. We can see here what is missing if we're looking at behavioral health, which are master's level, certified professional counselors, li- uh, licensed marriage and family therapists, substance abuse counselors. None of these are in the Medicare approved list of providers so that for a Medicare encounter, those providers cannot bill for an encounter. LPC, license LFMT, I get the alphabet soup mixed up sometimes. These are our Medicare providers. However, at the state level, it's important to take a look at, and I've looked now at Kentucky, Illinois, Ohio. I haven't looked directly at Michigan, uh, but most states now at the state Medicaid level include these licensed clinical addiction counselors, marriage family therapists, 
and mental health counselors. In Indiana, we're going to use some specific modifiers for those providers. In addition to the clinical psychologist and the clinical social worker that we see at Medicare. And I believe in this, this would include, uh, I don't see it expressly on this list, but I believe at the state level, those CPCs also count. Check before you go hire a CPC. But I'm assuming that since our addiction counselors, family therapists, and mental health counselors are approved providers, and remember, this is at the Medicaid level, these are at the Medicare level. So it's important to make that distinction. We have some more flexibility at the Medicaid level as far as providers than we do at the Medicare level. So uh, I'm not going to go into detail on Medicaid claims today because since we are cover covering the upper Midwest technically, even though this is Indiana, uh, you know, we have multiple ways of doing that. I mean, we just go down too many rabbit holes on it, uh, but we're going to cover a couple of the topics associated with that. So be sure and check, you know, most of our provisions at the Medicaid level mirror what happens at Medicare, but again, with the exception of this difference in providers. So our face-to-face -face definitions still count. We have an expanded provider list, but when we get into care management services, we're going to see that those are also Medicare-only services. Regardless, we have a 900 revenue code, which is our revenue code for behavioral health services. So we're going to bill our clinic visits uh, primarily with 521. And we can also have uh, behavioral health, mental health service distinguished on the same claim with a 900 revenue code. Um, so it's important to note, I know, you know, again, uh, any of these presentations, we could go down multiple rabbit holes on these topics. Um, my dollar amount is actually a little bit off here is 9203, call it 93 bucks, whatever you want to call it. But it's important to note that telehealth services at the Medicare level, any licensed provider in the state so it's a state licensure but any valid licensed provider in the state can provide telehealth services to medicare patients during the public health emergency only so that those same providers i just mentioned if they have valid licenses in the state right now they could provide telehealth services and bill our g2025 for 92 dollars during the public health emergency. Count on that going away. We're all wondering what is gonna stay and what's gonna go after the public health emergency. And I promise you this, any valid, any licensed provider in the state can see patients via telehealth, absolutely that will go away. But for right now, during the public health emergency, we can do that. So that's important to know. Of course, uh, Somebody asked me yesterday for a succinct way, I think it was Becky, of distinguishing FQHC from RHC. And my response was, well, at the kind of service definition level, like we've seen, you know, who are providers, what's an encounter, incident two services, uh, FQHC services versus non FQHC services, et cetera, all of those things are very similar to one another between rural health and FQHC. FQHC have some benefits that RHC don't and some additional providers like diabetic, uh, excuse me, medical nutrition therapy and uh, diabetic self-management training. Am I getting those acronyms right? That's an FQHC benefit. That's not an RHC benefit. But most of our service definitions are common. When we start billing claims, we immediately depart from one another and we have big differences. And first of all, the, the one big difference is that FQHCs are on a PPS rate and rural health clinics are on the all-inclusive rate. An all-inclusive rate, we submit an annual cost report and we get a different rate potentially every year. Under PPS, we still submit a cost report, 
but effectively we i call it the ronco method it's not really accurate we set it and forget it you get a pps rate it doesn't change we get annual cost of living increases like we saw in the fee schedule presentation but uh, our cost report we don't get a new rate every year with our cost report we're on prospective payment system so there are some key differences between the two even though we have our pps rate feels like an all-inclusive rate they feel the same they're set differently that's the big difference but the other massive departure we have are our g codes that we deal with as fqhc so we have our five fqhc payment codes you can call it payment codes g codes g payment codes g codes it's confusing of course because our preventive services also have g hic pick codes and so sometimes it's difficult to distinguish when we're talking through these are we talking about the fqhc payment code or are we talking about a preventive hic pick code i'm always going to make the distinction i'm going to say an fqhc g payment code so we know we're talking about our five specific G, FQHC G payment codes and the two that pertain to behavioral health for us today are the G0469 FQHC G payment code and the G04C, G0470 FQHC G payment code. The 469 is for a uh, established patient, no, new patient, excuse me, I always have to look. G0469 new patient g0470 established patient so anything that happens any cpt codes we're going to use our g payment code we apply a charge amount to that that represents our common basket of services for a new patient receiving a behavioral health service the we have to select the payment code that corresponds to the visit that qualifies for our encounter. These codes will correspond to the appropriate PPS rate. So we're gonna report a charge for the G visit code that reflects the sum of our regular rates charged to beneficiaries. In RHC, we bundle the services in our FQHC, we have a common uh, basket of services that we typically provide to these beneficiaries and that reflects the charge amount that we assign every time we use a g0470 code so we're not going to fluctuate our g payment code charge amounts but the detail that gets reported with them will flux fluctuate so we're going to report the g code we're going to report all service lines and associated charges. We give a shot, uh, whatever it is. Remember, we have non FQHC services, so our lab services would go elsewhere. But so our incident two services are going to report it on the claim, but they're not paid. And much like in a rural health clinic, they're not separately billable. And the payment for these services are included in our payment under the FQHC G payment code. So, uh, the payment for the FQHC encounter, it requires us to perform a medically necessary face-to-face -face visit and we'll assign one of our G payment codes to that corresponding service line that describes a qualifying visit. So long story short, here are the service detail lines, our qualifying visit. We still have qualifying visits in our FQHC. We have a common qualifying visit schedule and we have seven of these services which represent qualifying visits for behavioral health so for medicare we have to have one of these qualified visits assigned to one of our two fqhcg payment codes for reporting so that our claim is going to look like this so an established patient g0470 i got ahead of myself a little bit on the date I'm looking forward to new year's eve i guess so where our typical bundle of services for an established patient that receives a mental health service is $320, and that includes a $120 uh, 
therapy and two hundred dollar pharmacological management. And actually, our total charge on that is warped. It really should be uh, three twenty plus three twenty, so it should be seven forty. But we know we get paid on that G payment code. Now, how do we calculate that? How do we calculate our payment? Well, first of all, we don't have any charges that are prevented. And remember on our fee schedule, we talked a little bit, we're gonna talk more in depth about how we calculate the payment for each of our encounters. But we're remember, we talk about our lesser of cost to charge. So in this case, our $320 is far exceeds our PPS rate of $168. So Medicare is going to pay the lesser of the two, the lesser of our charge or our PPS rate. So Medicare is going to pay us 80% of our PPS rate in this instance. And the coinsurance is going to be $64 of the G code charge, $320. So when we add those together, we're going to get almost $200 for this visit. So I'll leave that up for a second. So let's go through that one more time. So we always have the lesser of cost to charge. Medicare is going to pay the lesser of our PPS rate or our charge amount. We saw in the fee schedule examples, we saw where uh, most of our E&M codes, we weren't getting up over our PPS rate. But for our behavioral health services, we did. So our G code charge amount of $320, which happens to equal the service detail because those are the services that we normally provide. And since our PPS rate is less than our G code charge amount of 320, Medicare is going to pay us 80% of our PPS rate, again, because that is less than our G code charge amount. We're going to get 20% of our G code charge amount, 320, as coinsurance. Total reimbursement for this claim is $198.58. So, now, we have multiple encounters are allowed when the patient suffers a subsequent illness or injury. That subsequent illness or injury requires additional diagnosis or treatment on the same day. The patient has a medical visit and a behavioral health visit on the same day, or the patient has a welcome to Medicare, separate or subsequent Medicare, or excuse me, welcome to Medicare visit, separate clinical visit, and a behavioral health visit on the same day. So we get two, three, even if we get, we can almost have four. But we're not here to talk about those. We're here to talk about the fact that we can have a separate behavioral health visit on the same day as an FQHC encounter. And when that happens, we're going to have two G code totals separately calculated. I didn't do that in this instance. And we're going to report those on the same claim so that we can see our regular. Established patient G0, G0466. Uh, I said established patient, I meant new patient. With a new patient level three in injection. And then we see our FQHC G code for a new patient as well at $150 and our new patient psychological evaluation for 90791. We have a hefty total on here. But again, the charges, our encounter payments are going to be based on the 195 and the 150. So it looks like in this instance, we'll probably get 80% uh, of our PPS rate on the clinical visit, but we'll only get 80% of our charge on the medical visit. And that's probably backwards. I don't know that that $150 is a good real world example on a new patient behavioral health visit. It's probably higher than that. So that's probably where this example is off. But the point is to see how we would report the line items on the same claim as a clinical visit. And then we get two encounters calculated separately from one another when we report this way. So this is kind of our vanilla behavioral health. You know, our licensed clinical social worker, our clinical psychologist sees the patient, does their thing, and we have a face-to-face -face visit. That's how we bill those. So fairly straightforward, not a lot of, you know, I think uh, controversial, complicated thought processes behind those. But let's talk about behavioral health integration and psychiatric coordination and care services. And let's see what I think many of us have been missing. So first we have 
and this comes from uh, almost every bit of language I have in this today, I think every single sentence is directly out of the claim processing manual or the Medicare benefit policy manual. So the section 230.2 .2 comes directly out of the Medicare benefit policy manual. And it says that care management services in RHCs and FQHCs include our transitional care management, chronic care management, but we also have this general behavioral health integration and psychiatric collaborative I can't speak, pardon me, psychiatric collaborative care model, coordination of care management. Uh, these face-to-face -face requirements are waived for these care management services. So we have a different series of services here that we don't have to have a face-to-face -face encounter like we would on these claims that we just looked at the example here. We have coordination of care services, which include, look, it includes transitional care management. So I don't have this on a slide anywhere, but if you're billing for chronic care management or behavioral health integration, you cannot bill transitional care management because those services would be included in our care management services. But the important thing is here that we don't have face-to-face -face requirements for these services these services, chronic care management, here's where I think we stop. Chronic care management includes chronic care management and behavioral health integration. Behavioral health integration is a team-based collaborative approach to care that focuses on integrative treatment of patients with primary care and mental or behavioral health conditions. So here's what I'm going to say at the end of this, but I wanna start re-emphasizing now. And why I went in to the hard stop for rural health clinics that we can't exceed on the rural health clinic side, 51% of our services, but that we appear to have a different statutory threshold for FQHCs, but we see that our behavioral health integration is an approach that we wanna treat we want an integrative treatment of patients with primary care and behavioral health conditions. So the important thing I'm going to emphasize here is that when, when we're seeing substance abuse patients, or if you're integrating a Suboxone clinic, that you do not just have a horde of patients, which become Suboxone patients, and that's the only reason you've ever seen that patient is to treat and to prescribe Suboxone. So the point is treat the whole patient. Don't just treat their behavioral health condition. Make sure our behavioral health and our substance abuse patients get in to see our primary care providers and they are seen and we're seeing the whole patient. And then of course, yes, we're treating their substance abuse disorders, but how many of our patients have multiple clinical conditions in addition to that substance abuse disorder. So the important thing is for any of these services, both chronic care management and behavioral health integration services or psychiatric coordination of care, we have to have an initiating visit. Within one year of initiating care management services. So remember when care management services came out, we had some rolling service requirement changes. And um, now one of those changes was with the initiating visit, before we had to have a separate initiating visit, it didn't matter what. Now, as long as we've seen the patient within a year, we can establish coordination care services. But it can't be more than one year before and of course, if we're seeing that patient with the intent to establish behavioral health integrative services to address substance abuse disorders, we're still treating the whole patient during this initiating visit. We don't have to discuss their psychiatric disorders during the initiating visit, um, but we can use that initiating visit to 
start these care management or behavioral health integrative services. So the care, the initiating visit can be used any, any visit. If we've seen the patient within one year, any visit can be our initiating visit. And we don't have to have discussed men, mental health disorders during that visit. We just have to already have been seeing the patient, but it's an important, this is an important opportunity to treat more than just the substance abuse disorder, which is the important undercurrent of everything we're going to say. And enormously important requirement for care management services is beneficiary consent. So we must get consent after the initiating visit to say, hey, we're going to bill you because it's going to be uh, one bill every month as long as we meet the service thresholds. We actually, that's one misnomer. Just because we initiate care management services doesn't require a monthly line item to be built. But of course, if we have a care plan and we're being responsible about following that care plan, we, we should have clinical follow-up every month and something to bill every month. I think it's the spirit of the service that we're, we're, we're coordinating services with that patient on a monthly basis. But it's really important for the patient to know that, and I, I have a typo here, uh, excuse me, I, no, I, I, pardon me, I, I, I don't have a typo. I'm not even gonna say what I was about to say. It's important to get beneficiary consent and document that we have consent. We have to get the consent under direct supervision. That's what I was about to screw up. Consent must be made during the initiating visit or at another time by the RHC or FQHC primary care provider or remember direct supervision, it can be done by a nurse, but with that provider in the building, not necessarily in the room. Our coordination of care services themselves can be provided under general supervision, but our consent has to be obtained under direct supervision, which is the billing provider is in the clinic, not necessarily in the room. The beneficiary has to be notified and this is why the consent is so important because we're going to have activity that is under general supervision from the provider that also involves patient cost sharing. I'm doing that because it's normally phone activity, right? So our monthly activity is usually phone activity, but it's coordination of care services, CCM, all of these have cost sharing. So there is a co-insurance involved. So patient has to know and obtain, be, obtain, consent be obtained under direct supervision. There's cost sharing. We're gonna provide services from the nurse, et cetera. We're already doing a lot of these things. This is how you sell it. We already do a lot of these things, but this is a mechanism for us to get paid for following your care plan on a monthly basis for services that we don't have any other way to get paid for. They have the right to, I skipped one, only one provider can be doing these uh, in any calendar month. So I think, yes, if we have psychiatric, psychiatric coordination of care happening, we don't get the general coordination of care. We're gonna see those, so we get one or the other. And if another provider down the street has a care plan and has initiated uh, care management services, we can't bill on top of those. So only one at a time. They can stop it at any at any time. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna stop care because we can't bill coordination care services anymore. And they can also consult with any other specialists that they want to. The point is, is that we have someone in our clinic under general supervision providing auxiliary services that count towards our care management time. Remember, we're about to see for each of these levels of service, we have a certain amount of time per month that our, our auxiliary personnel can furnish under general supervision. So remember, the consent must be get, may, uh, obtained under direct supervision. The actual care functions that we're doing 
on a monthly basis can be provided under general supervision, which again does not require the RHC practitioner to be in the same building or immediately available, but they are all under the overall supervision and control of the RHC practitioner. So pretty loose supervision. So basically our nurse can be making phone calls and providing uh, care management activity when the docs out of the building or the nurse practitioner is the billing, they're the they're the ordering provider. We we can be we can do that differently than like our incident two services, which require direct supervision. That's the whole point. We're making phone calls, coordinating referrals, coordinating community resources, checking up on the patient via the phone. Our nurse is doing this, and as long as we meet certain time thresholds per month, we're able to bill that. And all of that nursing activity can be under general supervision. And these are not face-to-face. -face, so we can be paid for these separate from our PPS rate. So like when we give an injection and we don't have a face-to-face -face visit, so we don't have anything to bill, we don't have that situation here. All of our care management services provided by auxiliary clinical personnel, they have to be clinical personnel. They cannot be receptionists. They cannot be uh, non-clinical people, office manager, they have to be clinical people under general supervision. We can bill it. We have to have a comprehensive care plan. This is the linchpin of our care management services, be they psychiatric, behavioral health integration, or clinical in nature. We have to have a comprehensive care plan. Uh, and the purpose is to create, revise on an ongoing basis, and monitor the care plan we have to have an electronic care plan, which is based on the patient's physical, mental, cognitive, psychosocial, functional, environmental, and uh, includes an inventory of their resources and family support, comprehensive care plan for all health issues with particular focus on the conditions being managed. And the care plan must be available electronically so we can share it with outside providers and we're the billing practice so we can of course be able to share that internally as well and we need to be able to share that information electronically before we lowered some of these th service thresholds that were too difficult to meet we had to be able to share the care plan via discrete data electronically which nobody really could do but now electronic sharing of that uh, includes faxing so that's good so uh, we need to share that on a timely manner. We can fax it out in and outside of our, our own practice so that we're sending this to referring providers, et cetera, so that we're monitoring, revising the care plan. And of course the patient and their caregiver need to get a copy of it. Here's what the care plan would include. This is all directly, including this, this is all direct language from the care management services fact sheet. So here's our care plan includes these items, problem list, et cetera, et cetera, symptom management, medication management, that pharmacological management we we're talking about, community service referrals, how other agencies, et cetera, outside the practice are gonna be utilized and how often are we reviewing this care plan? That of course is different than managing the care plan. So we have to have the care plan and we have to be managing the care plan and systematically assessing the patient's needs and making sure they're receiving timely preventive services. We're doing medication reconciliations. We have oversight of the patient's self-management of their medication. There's all these nursing services, right? And coordinating with external resources. So here's where I think we miss the boat in our FQHCs and RHCs. We know this care management service. We all know this one. We have to have two or more chronic conditions. They're actually in our e &M, we're gonna roll out. We all got principal care management too. So principal care management is about to be added to this effective one of 2021, where 
not only if the patient has multiple chronic conditions, but if they have one chronic condition. So principal care management, chronic care management, multiple chronic conditions, one chronic condition. I don't have the principal care management definition built into these slides, but the point is we know this one. Two or more chronic conditions expected to last 12 or more months put the patient at significant risk of de de uh, decompensation or decline. We miss this one. It also includes 20 minutes of qualifying behavioral health integrative services during a calendar month where one or more new or pre-existing behavioral health, sorry to be reading to you, behavioral health or psychiatric conditions being treated by the RHC primary care pr pr practitioner, including substance abuse disorders that in the clinical judgment of our RHC provider or FQHC provider warrants behavioral health integration. So behavioral health integration, 20 minutes per beneficiary per month counts in exactly the same way as this does including substance abuse disorders. So I don't know of anyone utilizing this. So we have two options for G0511 patient eligibility option. A, our standard two or more chronic conditions. Now we have principal care management, which is also gonna count. And we have option B, any bit, any bit. So we're not just talking about substance abuse. We're including substance abuse and any behavioral health or psychiatric condition pretty wide open. So I really, I don't know of anyone using that. So here I have a duplicate slide in here, pardon me. For all of the patients meeting requirements of option uh, B. So if we're gonna utilize option B, we need to have these items documented in that patient's record. We have an initial assessment or follow-up monitoring, which we use validated rating scales. We have behavioral health planning in relation to the treat the conditions we're treating in the health plan. We include, we update, we revise the care plan for patients who are not progressing or whose status does not change. So this is a mechanism to keep track of our patients that aren't making any progress. That is the linchpin of this, that we have a care plan and we're managing the care and changing the care plan and tracking the patients to make sure that they are making progress. We facilitate and coordinate treatment with our psychotherapists, pharmapsychotherapy. So this can include, this is over and above our G0470 where we're seeing the patient in person. This is our behavioral health care team managing the patient's care. Now, the uh, this is about to change because we're going to add the two principal care management codes to this. But both the clinical care management services and our behavioral health integration services, the 20 minutes, are paid at $66.77. It's one of these aggregate codes that's based on all going to soon to be five codes, which will include the principal care management. It gets updated annually. So we're about to see this amount change and coinsurance applies to this G0511. Coinsurance applies. So these apply to both the to both our care management and our behavioral health integration, $66.77. Now we also have an extended level of care management service. I know of nobody that's ever used this. So I think it's something that is uh, a big missing component to our care programs. So we have under a psychiatric coordination of care model, 
We have a primary care team. So that goes back to, we need to be sure we're treating the whole patient and not just a psychiatric condition. We're not just a suboxone clinic. And our primary care providers work in collaboration with a health healthcare manager who also works in collaboration with our psychiatric consultant to integrate primary health care services with care management support. So again, we have to treat the whole patient. We can't just treat their behavioral health conditions. We still have to have an initiating visit. But for G0512, we're going to have at least 70 minutes of care in the first month. We're going to have 60 minutes of subsequent care and 60 minutes of care in subsequent months. And this will be under the direction of our RHC or FQHC provider. And these services will be rendered by that practitioner or the behavioral health care manager. So for example, our clinical social worker can pr be providing these coordination of care services in addition to the face-to-face -face visits that are being rendered, or we can have both. So we can have our nurse practitioner uh, you know, so, so we have a lot of flexibility in how we can do this. And these can both be under general supervision. These can be billed alone or with other services. And for this elevated 70 minutes, 60 minutes, we have a payment of $141.83, which also gets updated annually. And also coinsurance does apply to that. So it's a pretty nice benefit that I think is to say it's underutilized because I know of no one using it ever. I've never heard of anyone using it. So we have these practitioner care requirements. So we have our, you know, basically our medical director or nurse practitioner, whomever is directing the clinic also directs our healthcare manager. Um, they oversee our beneficiaries care. So they're involved. Again, we're not just treating psychiatric or behavioral health or just Suboxone, we're treating the whole patient. Our behavioral health manager, look, is a designated individual. Everyone, I think, is this is part of why we don't use this. How does this differ from our practitioner? They're a care manager designated with formal education and specialized training in behavioral health, including social work. So that master's level LPC that maybe doesn't count for Medicare will certainly count here. Uh, that patient, that person has specialized training in behavioral health, including social work, not requiring that they be a social work and include social work, nursing or psychology, a lot of flexibility here, and has a minimum of a bachelor's degree in a behavioral health field, such as clinical social work or psychology, or is a clinician with behavioral health training, including RNs and, and LPNs. So behavioral health candidates, so think this is the person making the calls, coordinating the care, making sure they're coming in for their appointments, helping with med recs on the phone, and the behavioral health care manager. So look, this can be a lot of people up to and including our licensed clinical social worker. And also, I don't want to say down to because I never minimize our nursing staff, our RNs, LPNs, there are angels in healthcare. God love them. Um, I just can never, you know, they're the ones providing the care. In this case is another example. They're the ones making the phone calls, doing the coordination to get the patient in for the face-to-face -face visit. They can furnish both face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face -face services under general supervision, under general supervision. So that provider that we're going to bill under doesn't necessarily have to be in the clinic and they can be working under contract to the RHC. So it can be a contracted provider. Don't go down that rabbit hole. Uh, don't take that too far. So general supervision, behavioral health care, care manager. I think we have a lot of flexibility with this. So they're providing assessment care management services, including administer a rate at, you know, evaluating patients on the rating scales, assessing, providing planning. I'm not going to read all these to you providing brief, Interim interventions, you know, they're on the phone. We're collaborating with the provider. We're tracking and, pa and tracking patients, follow up and progress with a registry. 
We have a psychi psychiatric consultant that we're consulting with. We can provide some face-to-face -face interaction with the patient. We have a continuous ongoing collaborative relationship with the patient and the rest of the care team. Our psychiatric consultant is somebody who's contracted. They're not in the clinic seeing uh, patients face-to-face. -face. They're, you know, can be uh, outside the clinic. They just need to participate in regular reviews over clinical status of our patients. They're interacting with our um, RHC provider and our behavioral health care manager and helping manage negative interactions and negative outcomes in treatment and helping refer to appropriate resources. So we have to have a psychiatric consultant on the team. So I would anticipate that we would be uh, doing at least quarterly meetings that we're documenting with a psychiatric consultant that we're going over our problem cases and maybe reevaluating those that are having some negative react, uh, interactions, et cetera. But the psychi psychiatric consultant is a required member of the team. So we can build these services alone or with another valid encounter. Uh, the G0512 doesn't have to be, if it's a bet, I just used a behavioral health encounter on this. It could be a clinical visit. Uh, I used $170 service on that. I don't know that, well, that, I'm sorry, that's 166 on that one. So yes, I don't like to set these fees too far over the Medicare allowable because our Medicare patients and our rural health clinics and FQHCs are generally at risk patients and we don't need to stick them for their coinsurance. So set these close to the allowable for these types of services. We saw how that was problematic if we had elevated charges on the telehealth services. So uh, these are two good claim examples. Uh, I've screwed up my dates there, pardon me on that. But so the point here is we can build these alone or with other services, but we cannot provide these at the same time with transition uh, with TCM services. So remember, we're here to perform primary care services. We don't have as hard stop on like rural health. We have to be 51% primary care, but it does say in here, as with RHCs, FQHCs are also facilities primarily engaged in providing services typically furnished in an outpatient clinic. Now, even though it doesn't say that, I quibble with this language, but it says, primarily engaged in providing outpatient clinic services operationally what the regulators come in and say is they mean primarily primary care services so services now this the social security act defines primary care services as family practice internal medicine ob and peds so you don't have the state operations manual that ha that says the same primarily engaged in means 51%. I did not consult the HRSA manual on that, but we do have an expectation that we are providing primarily primary care services as FQHCs, even though we have the ability to provide behavioral health integration and substance abuse so we need to really make sure we're treating and documenting that we're treating all patient conditions. We're treating that patient COPD, hypertension, diabetes, and their substance abuse. We're not just treating their di the, the psychiatric conditions. I, I don't know of any FQHCs that have gotten in trouble. I know a couple RHCs that in essence, they were suboxone clinics. And I think that's what the impression was when the surveyors came and 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 all of the medical records just said suboxone 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 so that's why it's really important that that's not what our medical record looks like we have by policy and practice a mission and whatever you want to call it, posture that we're treating all patient conditions, not just their psychiatric conditions. And our inf it appears to be less formal on FQHC, but that it is 51% of our total provider hours are family practice, internal medicine, P0 B. And that as long as that's the case, certainly 
Behavioral health integration, behavioral health disorders are an important component of what we're doing as FQHCs and RHCs. So I would love to hear from somebody that saw this presentation and said, we're gonna go try that G0512. Now remember both the G0511 and G0512 are Medicare only codes. Those use care management services are Medicare only. Our other behavioral health providers we looked at, we can have face-to-face -face encounters with those, but the care management service program is unique to Medicare. It does not apply to the states. But I'd love to hear somebody come back and say that they've tried it. Again, standard references here, 90 percent of my language came out uh, directly out of chapter nine and chapter 13 claim processing and the rest that didn't came out of the care management services fact sheet uh, which is right here I uh, don't have a link on there but that's really easy to find and I encourage everyone to go look at it, it does have good information that's good and concise so that's it I hope uh, there were some nuggets of something new to try here and good luck with it. I'd love to hear uh, some folks come back and tell me that they've tried this and they've got a successful program. So, thank you. <clears throat> oh, wow. I went longer than I thought. Uh, no, so that's all right. You're minutes fine. Minutes for questions if we've got any. Sure. We've got about five minutes left for questions. So, go ahead and put those in the QA. And uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to ask Carolyn to. Go ahead in the chat and put in our link to our short survey. It'll just take a minute or two. But since we're federally funded, uh, we do request feedback, and it's part of our reporting that we submit to HRSA. So again, Charles, thank you so much. You are such a wealth of information. Thank and thank you. you for tickling my fancy and, and digging into the differences between RHCs and FQHCs. So I'll remember now when to use the air rate and when to use the um, yep. encounter rate. Yep. Well, if I don't talk to you, which I don't think we will, but have a nice holiday. Thank you for inviting me to participate and I look forward to January 12th. Absolutely. Have a nice Absolutely. holiday. Everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today.